Um, I think I've come to the wrong event. I mean, they, they said they wanted somebody who's really successful and stuff, and you've ended up with me. So um, my apologies for that. Um, so I'm going to tell you my, my story, but I'd like to start with my passion. So I'm really passionate about my family. I'm passionate about fairness. I'm passionate about helping the underrepresented. Uh, I'm passionate about fast cars, fine wine, um, music, uh, <laughs> cycling. <laughs> uh, I have all of these passions, right? Um, but my, my motto um, uh, comes from a mentor I had many, many years ago. Uh, and this is kind of how I like to tell you this story. But my, this mentor, um, he said to me many years ago, he said, um, we go through these phases in life. We go through a, a learning phase, then we go through an earning phase, and then we go through a serving phase. Uh, but what if you could do all of those things at the same time and continue to do that for your whole life? So I'm going to kind of tell you my story uh, around those three themes. And I'll start with, you know, my, 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 my learning phase and tell you a bit about my, my background. So I was born in Leeds. Um, my father was from Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, he was black. My mum was from the UK, English. Dad came from a very poor background. Um, and uh, he got a scholarship to go to the University of Leeds. And that's where my parents met. Uh, and that's where uh, I was ultimately born. Um, I then, at the age of three, um, moved to Trinidad and Tobago, and that's where I lived. That's where my formative years really happened, and uh, it was the most incredible experience because it was wild, it was free, it was really safe for kids, um, and you know I had a wonderful time. I mean, I, doing things like um, playing rotten grapefruit fights. So you know, you pick up a rotten grapefruit and you find somebody and you, you slam them with it. Right? That's the that was the game. Right? That was one of the games. Another game was um, hanging on to branches of trees and trying to kick the other person until they got down to the ground or, you know, just cy cycling or playing cricket in the street. You know, that was the, the childhood that I have. That was part of my childhood. The other part of my childhood was I was the eldest of six kids. Um, I was the eldest of uh, three, we had three boys, my mum and dad, and then three girls in that, in that order. And so I got used to responsibility from a very early age. You know, I was expected to and did uh, cook Sunday lunch from the age of 11. And by Sunday lunch, I mean, you know, stew chicken, roast um, uh, uh, plantain, uh, callaloo, rice and peas, you know, the whole thing, right, at 11. Uh, but I was also expected to do the gardening, right, to be up and down at the lawnmower, and, by the way, to look after my brothers and sisters, you know, to give them bottles of feed and change their nappies, as I tell them now. Just remind them, put them back in their, their, their box, right, there, there you are. Um, just to remind them, that was this sort of, you know, that was this sort of upbringing and, and life that I had. And I remember um, being young, and it wasn't that long ago, I hear you say. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and I was, I was in this place, right, um, not quite sure whether, you know, to hang with the black guys or the, the white guys. You know, I was kind of torn. My personality was a bit not quite sure where I sat. And then... You know, after much angst and so on, I kind of came to the conclusion that actually, you know, why would I, why would I define myself by a colour? Um, you know, I was me. I was, I was a citizen of the world and, and that was what I was. Um, and I remember at the age of 12, my, my mum saying, look, you know, you spent all of your life in, in Trinidad and Tobago. Time to go, you know, visit the other part of your heritage, which was the UK. And so I spent a summer uh, in the UK doing all the normal things that, that you'd expect. Anyway, flip forward a couple of years, um, went to school, did really well, uh, until I got to secondary school, and I kind of hung out with a bit of the wrong crowd. Um, I remember coming home to my expectant parents, and my parents, my dad was a finance director, and my mum was a university lecturer, uh, and they were, you know, said, how do you, how do you get on at, at GCSE, or O-levels as they were called at the time, and I said, well, you know, kind of okay, they were a bit underwater. I said, what do you mean underwater? I said, well, they were all, my grades were all at sea level or below. <laughs> um, <laughs> and they weren't, they weren't that impressed with that, that story, right? Because they, they had, you know, much bigger expectations of me as the eldest of six kids and, you know, the person that they kind of hoped would go on and do the things that, that they'd done. But I was, I was clear. I just wanted to, to leave. I wanted to be in the real world. I wanted to work. Uh, and, um, and so I did that. But... I remember that night uh, I got my results, even though they were pretty bad, four, four C's, um, going out and um, I got into a car accident. And um, 
you know, I ended up having my, my finger amputated because uh, it was so badly crushed. And I was the lucky one, right? I could, it could have been my arm, it could have been uh, my hand, it could have been my life. It could have been my friends. I had three friends in the car. I was the one driving, and they could have been hurt. Um, I was with my seven-year-old nephew over the weekend, and he said, uh, why have you got a meatball for a finger? Because, you know, he's looking at this stump, and you think it reminds him of a meatball. So I just thought that was so, you know, amazingly funny for a kid to think about, you know, me, my finger being a meatball, not, uh, not anything else. Everybody else calls it a stump, right? But he called it, he called it a meatball. Um, anyway, so, um, so I, 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 I then uh, left, left, left school, uh, went to work in a bank, did that for 18 months, saw how much money other people made, decided I wanted some of that too. Um, and so I, 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 in, I, I worked with a bank manager, encouraged the bank manager to lend me all of the money to buy a truck. So I was going to set up my own business. I wanted to be a millionaire, right? And I wanted to be a millionaire by the time I was 21. Um, I think I was 18 at the time. And uh, he lent me all the money despite not having a single contract. Um, you know, he had that level of trust uh, in me. And, um, and I did this for two and a half years. And it was great fun. You know, hired people, carried everything from... Uh, cement to live chickens, they were fun, um, to boxes. Um, did that for two and a half years and then the economy just completely went flat and my business came to a standstill and I had at that point realized I had nothing, right? I had no, no qualifications really, I had no assets apart from this truck that I still owed money on um, and then I had a, a sort of really life-changing event happen to me at that point and I remember waking up at about six in the morning, being woken up by horns and the gate rattling out, uh, went out. And I, as soon as I walked out, I knew that something was, was wrong, really badly wrong. And my, a, a very old friend of my dad was there with a policeman. Uh, and he said, uh, very sorry, put his arms around me. He said, um, sorry to tell you, Adrian, but your dad has just died. Uh, and we need you to come along to the morgue to identify him. I was uh, 17, I think, at the time. My mum was away. Uh, she was studying, she was doing her PhD in the UK at the time. And so I went along to the morgue and they, you know, pulled him out and he was on this tray at the bottom. And they looked nothing like him, but I knew it was him. Um, and he had a, a car accident. He was always passionate about cars. And I remember him taking us in a Capri. You're probably too young to know what a Capri is, but he used to race around with me and my younger brother in it. Um, and, you know, he used, to do, he used to go for drives to kind of relax him and stuff. Well, on this occasion, he went straight into a bridge and died instantly. And it was really at that point that I realized that I needed to do something really differently, that you know, I needed to step up. Um, I needed to be you know, a strong uh, uh, brother to my sisters and, and other brothers and to help, help my mum. And so that for me was a real turning point uh, in my life and really got me to focus more. I'd always been passionate about food. I'd learned how to cook, I told you that. Um, I wanted to be a millionaire, I wanted to run my own business. And so I went to hotel school. Uh, in Trinidad and Tobago, did a two-year diploma there, did really well, uh, came out as the top student. And then I came to the UK, uh, and I thought, because my, my, my mum and my brothers and sisters were here, um, and I thought I'd do one more year, and I'd have my degree in hotel management. Problem was that the two years that I'd just done weren't uh, accredited. So, start from scratch. Um, what do you do? Um, so I said, okay, um, I'll go and do an access course. Uh, this was for mature students to get into university. Did that for a year, and then got into Manchester University. Uh, Manchester University I was there for three years. Um, it was pretty tough because I didn't have a grant. Um, I had to fund myself through university. I had to work every weekend uh, and holiday to do it. Um, but I, you know, I had a great time. Managed to get a black belt in judo at the same time. And I remember, um, I remember being uh, called, uh, having done my final year exams, by the, one of my tutors, and he said, "Adrian, fantastic." You got your first class degree. You know, that's what I really wanted. I felt great. This is wonderful. This is, worked so hard for this, right? And then about two days later, he called me up again. He said, listen, uh, terribly sorry. Shouldn't have told you your result. Uh, the external examiners came along. And on one of your papers, they marked you down from 70 to 67. And there went my first class degree. 2-1. Wow. Ooh, <laughs> that one hurt, right? Because <laughs> it was so close. It was so close. Anyway, move on from that, uh, went to, straight on to Manchester Business School uh, to do my MBA. And they don't let, generally don't take people who just come from undergrad straight into business school. But because I'd worked before, because I'd run my own business, they, they let me in. And two years later, I graduated with a distinction. 
it was a really tough time, really tough time. I remember uh, graduating and having literally to apply for 200 jobs uh, before I got offered two. One was for Ford and one was for Barclays. And in the end, I took the job with Ford because I'm a much better fit with the work that I'd done. Um, then I got a call from Headhunters. So um, I'm sticking on the earning theme here, right? This is all the work stuff. Um, Headhunters saying that um, they work for Google. Uh, they were really interested in my profile. And I said, well, I love the brand, right? I love the brand Google, but I don't know what I would do for you. I can't imagine what I would do for Google. You're this thing, right? You're this internet thing. You don't have real, real people working for you, surely. Um, and they said, yes, we do. And they showed me the job spec. And when I looked at the description and the qualifications, this was my job, right? This, this was me. Um, and so I spent a lot of time doing due diligence. I spoke to a lot of people in industry about, um, about uh, you know, whether this would be a really good job. You probably think it's incredibly naive, and it was. I mean, I, I was asking them questions like, is Google, is Google going to be a successful company? Are they going to be, are they going to be good? You know, are they going to list? Are they going to last? You know, I mean, this was like 10 years ago, right? This was before Google. We were 17, Google was 17 years old uh, two weeks ago. That was the, the, that I say to mind, right? I've always doing the due, due diligence on them. And I remember um, being offered the job. I had seven interviews with, with Google. And my last interview, um, told me a lot about the company because it was with uh, a lady who was the first employee in the UK. She was very senior and she said, um, said look, I'm really sorry, Adrian, at the phone interview. Got to do a phone interview. Said, uh, if you hear gurgling in the background, it's my baby. Uh, I'm just feeding him a banana whilst we do the interview. And I thought, what? Is, are, you, are you like serious? Are you, are, you, are you interviewing me for this big job and you're, you're feeding? And I just thought, wow, you know, I actually thought about it. This was really cool. If she could tell me this, you know, we could, we could, she could make a decision about this. And that's told me something about the company, right? About the ability to, to not have to be stereotyped and to think about, um, you know, doing things in a particular way and so forth. And so uh, I remember being offered the job at Google and at the same time I was offered a job at Nokia. And I went to my eldest son and I said, what do you think? Uh, he said, well, dad, he said, I love Google. The logo changes all the time every time you go on and so on. He said, do the Google thing. So that's what I did. That was, that was my decision-making process, right? <laughs> Having done all the due diligence and stuff, right? In the end, it was like, ask my, my, my son, and he was right. And I've loved every minute of it. It's a great organization to be in. Um, I headed up the automotive uh, advertising sales team initially. And then I headed up the enterprise division um, across EMEA. Then I had the search advertising team for part of the, 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 the cold but solvent parts of Europe. Um, uh, and now I head up, I think I'm in the sexiest part of the digital industry right now. And that might sound strange, right? Because this is, I'm talking about analytics and measurement, right? This is, this is deep, nerdy stuff. This is like big data and things like that. But that's the reality. I think this is genuinely the sexiest part of the industry right now. Right, so let me, let me move to the serving piece then. We've talked about the learning phase. Uh, the earning phase. I'll talk a little about serving. So um, I am still the chair of Race for Opportunity. Uh, this is my fourth year. I was told it'd be three years. It'd be half a day, a uh, quarter. It's nothing like that. It's a lot more intense. Um, I'm also on the board of business in the community. Our president is Prince Charles. Um, uh, what else do I do? I'm on the Powellist um, uh, Foundation as a trustee, where our goal is to help um, kids, many from black backgrounds, who are non come from non-privileged backgrounds to have this sort of access to mentoring, to coaching and so on that their more privileged uh, peers have. We run a summer school. I do a course there around managing your personal brand. Um, what else do I do? I'm also, as of September the 1st, I was appointed as a non-exec director of the Home Office. Um, I think the Prime Minister, in a, in a moment of, um, I don't know, you know, he must have just sort of skipped, you know, signed it off. Um, and, and so hence, and I'm now a non-exec director for the Home Office. And of course, Theresa May also I had to meet. And I'm actually delighted to be doing this because I think there's a lot that, that is good that's being done there. Uh, and from a, a diversity perspective, which I feel very passionately about, I think there's a lot that I hope that I can bring. And one of the things I did is a Seeing is Believing uh, project where I took 15 chief execs and senior people from Barclays, from Unilever, from Mediacom and so on, uh, down to Brixton Job Centre to meet some of these young people, uh, mainly black and Asian minority ethnic groups who were unemployed. And the purpose there was to connect them to the reality of what it was like to be a young black person without a job and for them to hear their stories directly. And I remember meeting this young man called, I'll call him Mo, um, he was a bit like Mo Farah. 
uh, but he had a bit more hair. Um, uh, and his story was he grew up, he grew up in Brixton and uh, uh, he left his, his peer group, went off to university. We met him 18 months later and he still didn't have a job. And he said, you know, it's really hard. I made this investment and I, I don't have a job. He said, you know what was really hard was coming back and, you know, people I, I grew up with saying, look, you know, why, what have you got, man? You know, I got the clothes, I got the car. You've gone off to university, you have nothing to show for it. And he said, you know what, I'm here for the long haul. Um, you know, I'm in it because, you know, I believe in my principles, I'm going to stick to them, uh, and that's what I'm going to do. I remember one of the people from, on, on the, the, one of the chief execs said, you know what, if, we're, if as a society we're failing young people like Mo, then we are failing as a society. So that's, you know, the reason that I feel really passionately about giving and about diversity. So that's my story. Um, three parts to it, the earning phase, uh, no, sorry, learning, earning and serving. Uh, and what really excites me is actually being able to do all three of those things uh, at the same time. So thank you. Thank you so much for watching. We hope you enjoyed it. Make sure you hit the subscribe button and watch the rest of our talks below.